Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Relationship Center. My name is Ernest Wamboye, and today we're looking at the subject of forgiveness. And we want to look at forgiveness in light of what Jesus has taught, because there are many people who champion forgiveness. There are many people who say that forgiveness is a virtue that we ought to uphold, and we do agree with that. However, many times people fail at forgiveness because people misunderstand forgiveness. People perhaps think that forgiveness means that you are allowing the other person to go scot-free and that forgiveness is antithetical to justice. Some people think that forgiveness is weakness. And there are some people who think that forgiveness is not possible, that it's, it's a crazy idea. Why in the world would you want to forgive someone yet they have hurt you. And in the minds of many people, that is an impractical idea. They say it's untenable. You cannot forgive someone who's hurt you because they'll have power over you. But the teachings of Jesus and the gospel gives us uh, give us a very different approach towards forgiveness. And we learn to forgive in the gospel in a way that is different from the world's way of forgiveness. The world may embrace forgiveness as a good virtue, but they often don't do it in light of the gospel. And to take us through this, we are going to look at Matthew 18, and we are going to um, look at what Jesus said to Peter. From verse 21 all the way down to verse 35, I'm reading from the New King James Version. So um, let's look at this. So it says in Matthew 18, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Verse 22, Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Look at what Jesus says. Therefore, it goes on to say, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, and when he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I want you to notice that, 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Verse 27, that the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Verse 28, but that master went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now I want you to notice that figure as well there, a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, verse 30, but went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Verse 32, then his master, after, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Again, something to note there, it says, You wicked servant. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant? Should you also not have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Verse 34, and his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And that's the word of the Lord. So this is the parable of the unforgiving servant and Jesus is giving us a standard of forgiveness, a gospel standard of forgiveness and giving us the heart of forgiveness. If you grasp this, ladies and gentlemen, you will have a smoother time in your relationships. There may be people who have hurt you. There may be people who have taken advantage of you and they have caused you intense pain and you understand that you need to forgive them. Um, let me begin by saying that forgiveness is a good thing and forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness does good to you. There are several studies that even show that holding in bitterness and having a lifestyle of pain and resentment can even contribute to certain diseases like cancer and high blood pressure. You don't want that. Forgiveness is not just good for 
you um in your soul but it's also good for you in your physical body your body can actually respond to how you respond to people's offenses and ultimately forgiveness is necessary because of your relationship with your god so let's look at verse 21 it begins by saying peter came to him and said lord how often shall my brother sin against me and i forgive him up to seven times now peter says seven times and Peter has most likely been offended by one of the disciples. This is most likely what, what would have happened because the disciples were always arguing. And uh, Jesus kept telling them, what are you arguing about? What are you bickering about? You know, what, what are you fighting about? So perhaps this was one of those times. Who knows? But the Bible says that Peter is offended by someone. And, you know, it suggests that Peter is offended by someone. And he comes to Jesus and he lays his uh, his his claim before Jesus, and he says, I need to forgive this person. How many times should I forgive them? Peter suggests a number. He says up to seven times. Peter must be feeling very generous with this number. He must be thinking, wow, seven times. And Peter is a Jew, so he knows he knows, he knows, knows what seven means in the Jewish culture. Seven is the number of completion. God created the world in seven days. Uh, the Bible says that silver is purified seven times for it to be absolutely pure. So when he says the number seven, he must be feeling very generous. He must be thinking, oh my goodness, I'm such a great guy. I've really forgiven this person. And Jesus counters peter look at verse 22 it says jesus said to him i do not say to you up to seven times all right but i say to you up to 70 times seven 70 times seven now jesus is just shattering peter's categories <laughs> he's saying seven no 70 times seven he's saying you think it's to forgive completely no it's to forgive completely and infinitely now, Jesus is not saying, do the math, 70 times 7, that's 490, and then keep count of the offenses, and then tell the person, you are very close to 490, you are now at 488, two more offenses before sunset, and you're out, you and I are done. <laughs> that's not what he's saying. He's basically saying, completely. The numbers here are not literal, they're figurative, okay? They're figurative to paint a picture of utter, complete forgiveness, then Jesus goes on and tells a story because what would Jesus' teaching be without a story? Stories hit home. And he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And then look at what he says, verse 24. When he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, you to look at that figure, 10,000 talents. Now, in our time, we don't understand what a talent is. We don't understand what 10,000 talents are. You know, we just think, that is biblical language. But I want you to look at this deeply. Um, you need to understand the culture of the time. So what is a talent? A talent was a measurement of gold that was used to pay huge debts. And a talent was a weight of gold between 33 to 50 kgs. Anything between 33 to 50 kgs. It was huge amounts of gold. And these huge portions of gold were most likely used for international transactions between nations. And this seems to be exactly what is happening right here. This seems to be uh, the kind of gold that is used to pay huge debts, the kind of gold that is kept in uh, the, king's, the king's treasury. And this king has a servant who owes him 10,000 talents. So if this is the king's gold, I want to assume that it's the best gold. So I'm not going to use the 33 kg weight. I'm going to use the 50 kg weight. So one talent, one talent, okay, is 50 kgs. Let's just go to the calculator. Let's turn to the calculator and see what uh, we have there. So let's do that. So one talent is 50 kgs. All right. Pesky advert right there. 50 kgs is one talent. How many talents does this guy owe the king? 10,000 talents. So to get a number of kilograms times 10,000. So this guy owes the king 500,000 kilograms of gold. 500,000 kilograms of gold. So that is a lot of gold, 500,000 kilograms. We want to find out how much gold costs today. Perhaps we could... We could do that. We could Google, right? So let's just go to Google and uh, let's just go back. I was on PC Mag. Um, the price of gold today. I was Googling that earlier. So 
So, all right, as you can see here, this is the gold price. This was three days ago. Um, right here, the current price up there, you can see it's $52,690. $52,690. $690 American dollars. So let's go back to our calculator. So one kilogram of gold, and by the way, that was one kilogram of gold, okay? This is the price per kg, okay? Um, the other website that talk about uh, the price per ounce, but this is uh, the price of gold per kilogram. Maybe let me just calculate that to, to be sure. The price of gold today per kilogram, just to, to ensure that that is accurate. Yep, that's 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 accurate. So um the price of one kilogram of gold of one one kilogram of gold is fifty-two thousand six hundred and ninety. So one kg of gold is fifty-two thousand. Let's just use fifty-two thousand as a rounded off figure. A kilogram of gold is fifty-two thousand USD. This guy owes the king five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand kilograms. To get the amount of money that would be, you'd multiply that 500,000 times the 52,000. And you find that this guy owes the king 26 billion USD. 26 billion USD. Now, if you're a Kenyan, you want to convert that into Kenyan shillings. The Kenyan the dollar is what? Is it at 125? So 3.25 trillion. That's the amount he owes the king. Let's go back to the story. Guys, he owes the king three point. Let me go back and just confirm that figure. It was huge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yes, that's a trillion because those are nine figures. Okay, it's uh three figures more. So a uh, billion is nine, so trillion is twelve, three point two five trillion. All right, he owes the king three point two five trillion. That ten thousand talents right there. That's 3.25 trillion. The question begs, what kind of shoddy businesses are you involved in to owe a king 3.25 trillion Kenya shillings or 26 billion USD? I'll tell you what kind of shoddy businesses you must be involved in. You must be a vessel king. You know what a vessel king is? A vessel king is a king who ruled on behalf of another king. So, for example, when the Romans conquered Israel, they put in a vessel king, King Herod. King Herod was not the rightful king of Israel. In fact, he was an Edomite. He was not an Israelite. But he was installed there by the Roman government to rule on their behalf. And he had to ensure that things worked well in Judea, things worked well in that area, and report to Caesar. So, this is exactly what's happening. This must be a vessel king. He's been put in charge of a certain land. And there's a faraway king who uh, has colonized this land. And what this vassal king has done is that he has squandered the economy of that country through corruption. He has perhaps uh, got his family property. He has impoverished the people. And the economy is suffering. The economy is in debt worth $3.25 trillion. Guys, look at this. It says he was not able to pay, verse 25. He was not able to pay. So the master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. So right here, the the master seems to be trying to recover what was lost, you know. He's trying to say, hey, um, sell him, sell his wife, his children, all the properties, you know, all the vehicles they've acquired illegally, all those apartments that they've acquired illegally, try and get me back my $3.5 trillion. Look at what verse 26 says. It says, The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Now, guys, <laughs> that statement makes me laugh. The servant says to the king, I will pay you all. Really? Can he really pay it all? Can he really pay it all? The answer is no, he cannot. Now, right here, Jesus is painting a picture to Peter. Jesus here is telling us that the king here, the king who owns this entire, um, this, this, the, the, who, who owns this, all this wealth and who uh, has even hired this servant and this servant who is a vessel king. <laughs> uh, the king is the Lord. The king is Jesus. The king is God. And we are these servants who have sinned against the king. And we have squandered the opportunity is given to us by our king, that's God. 
And if you took stock of how much you owe God, it would be equivalent to this servant owing the king 10,000 talents. The price, the debt, the price of your debt is so steep. It is so steep. It is in the trillions. Even if everything concerning you were to be sold and were to be uh, made to repay that debt, it's impossible. You cannot pay that debt. And Jesus is painting a picture saying that that is what we have done to God. He's given us an opportunity to rule and reign with him as vessel kings. But what have we done? We have squandered opportunities through our sin. We have lied. We have stolen. We have blasphemed. We've committed adultery. We've committed fornication. We have fallen short of God's glory. We are sinners. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We deserve to be punished. And God has come to collect. God has come. The time of judgment has come. But the master says, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Now, this shows you the futility of our good works. There's nothing we can do to pay back the king. Even if you are given a lifetime to pay $3.25 trillion, even if you are on a salary of $1,000 per month, that's a good salary, um, it would take you a lifetime to pay back this amount of money. Similarly, it's the same with us and God. We have sinned against him. And guys, if you looked at your sins, compare them to the holiness of God. If you looked at the holy, righteous standard of God, it would take a lifetime. It would take forever for you to pay. You cannot afford. You cannot even begin to afford to pay back. You see, even the money that you had in the first place as this servant was not yours. It was given to you. You'd have to start from scratch. And so here we can see how indebted we are to Jesus, how indebted we are to the king, and how futile and how puny and how worthless is our attempts to pay him back. Our good deeds are insufficient, are insufficient to please God and to pay back the debt of our sin. Now look at verse 27. And guys, if verse 26 was surprising to you, verse 27 should shock you. Verse 27 says, Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Guys, this is shocking. The master was moved with so was was this this is the king, the master of that servant. He was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Guys, right there on verse 27 is the gospel. That our debt of sin has been forgiven because God has had compassion on us. Now you need to understand that when this debt has been paid. It's going to be absorbed by someone. Who is going to absorb it? I'll tell you who's going to absorb it. The king is going to absorb it. You see, this debt, in the records of the king's books, in his account books, that money is missing from his treasury vault. When he releases this debt, it is recorded that this servant no longer owes the king that amount of money. But do you think that no one gets hurt because the debt has been forgiven? Nay. There's someone who bears the pain of 3.25 trillion, and that is the king. The king inflicts on himself the debt of the servant. He absorbs the debt of the servant so that the servant can be made free. And verse 27 is a picture of the cross. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did. That Jesus Christ on that cross absorbed the debt we ought to have paid. When he died on that cross, when he said it is finished, he was paying the debt you and I could never pay. And we could never pay it even if we're given a thousand lifetimes because the debt was huge, the debt was great, and our good deeds can never pay it. The wages of sin is death. You and I were doomed, destined to hell, but God, full of compassion, has released us and has forgiven us of our debts. Now, that's a wonderful story. And some of you may hear that and go like, wow, amazing. I love it. But the thing about Jesus' parables is that they often didn't end where people expected them to end. They didn't have the traditional happily ever after. The story continues, verse 28. This servant has been forgiven, and it says the servant went out and found on his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And they laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. Now, what is a hundred denarii? Okay, what is a hundred denarii? A hundred denarii is, um, denarii is plural, 
The singular is denarius. And a denarius is basically um, a silver coin that was used to uh, for uh, street transactions uh, during that time in Jesus' time uh, when the Romans had colonized uh, Israel. And if you took the silver of a denarius and you measured it today, it would be worth about, worth about $4, okay? One denarius. So a hundred denarii, that is $400, $400. So this servant goes out and finds a fellow servant who owes him $400. That is about 50,000 Kenya shillings. And what does he do? He takes him by the throat and he begins to choke him and says, pay me my 50,000 Kenya shillings. This is the servant who's just been forgiven a debt of 3.25 trillion. It goes on to say, verse 29, his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, I'm not sure I like verse 29, and look what it says, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Hmm, sounds familiar. Do those words sound familiar to you? Have mercy on me and I will pay you all. These are the exact words that were said in verse 26 by this other guy right there. Do you see that? This word was said in verse 26. Have patience with me and I'll pay you all. Right now, they are being said, right now, they're being said in verse 29. Have patience with me and I will pay you all. Now, let's think about it. The first servant owed the king 3.25 trillion. Could he pay it? Absolutely not. It's impossible. The second servant owes this other servant 50,000 Kenya shillings. Pragmatically speaking, can he pay it? I would say, yes, of course he can pay it. Of course he can pay it. Now, before we go on, Jesus is teaching Peter and consequently teaching us, his readers, a very important lesson. He's saying, Peter, every offense that you have towards me is almost figurative to a 3.25 trillion debt. However, However, every offense by anyone else towards you is figuratively like a 50,000 Kenya shilling debt. I want you to compare the two. Compare 3.25 trillion and compare 50,000 shillings. 50,000 shillings can be spent in a day, in a moment. 50,000 shillings can be... <laughs> 50,000 Kenya shillings cannot even get you... Some phones, there are phones that are twice that amount. <laughs> and yet, the Bible says that this guy owed his serv- owed this other servant 50,000 Kenya shillings. And yet, this first servant would not pay. Whenever we refuse, would, would not, would not, would not um, forgive him, rather. Okay, because it says in verse 30, the part, let me read verse 30, then I would make that point. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay his debt. Look at that. He would not forgive the 50,000 Kenya shilling debt, yet he has been forgiven over 3.25 trillion debt. What am I trying to say here, guys? Look at what Jesus is doing. Jesus is drawing us to compare. And that's why he was very specific in the amounts that he gave in this parable. He didn't just say a lot of money and some little money. He said 10,000 talents and 100 denarii. He's urging us to compare. He's saying every offense you have towards God, figuratively, is a 10,000 talent debt that is a 3.25 trillion debt and every offenses by anyone towards you is a hundred denarii debt is a 50,000 Kenya shilling debt he's saying when you are forgiven over 3.25 trillion debt do you know what you do you forgive every one of your debts when you don't forgive a 50,000 shilling debt it's because you do not understand you do not grasp that you and your entire family were meant to be sold into slavery to pay a 3.25 trillion debt. You are blind to the forgiveness of the cross. You are blind to what Jesus did for you on the cross. That's exactly what's happened to this servant. And that's what happens to us. How many times have we said to people who have hurt us, I could never forgive you of that. How many times have we said to people, you do not deserve my forgiveness? How many times have we said to people, you are not worthy of my forgiveness? How many times have we done that? How many times? 
For every time we do that, we are basically saying we will not let go of our 50,000 debts, all right, because we are feeling so offended, yet we forget that we are, we have been released of a debt of 3.25 trillion. This is the gospel that Christ has forgiven you and the amount that you owed God is great, so great, and it makes every other offense towards you infinitesimal. It's not that the offense and the pain that you feel is not valid. The pain that you feel is very valid. The pain from your parents, from your spouse, from your children, from your friend who betrayed you. The pain from the person who you trusted but released your secrets. The pain from the person who you gave your everything is a valid pain. It's very, very valid. However, compared to what God has done for you, comparatively, the, the natural response of the heart when it understands what the cross is, is to forgive that debt. And you see, the ratio of 3.25 trillion to 50,000 is almost like a constant. If the offenses of the people against you is more than 50,000, then guess what? The offenses... <laughs> all right, that you have committed towards God also comparatively increase. There's always that gap. There's always that tension between the offenses of men towards you compared to your offenses towards God. God is saying, please understand that if God did not forgive you, you would be burning in hell. Please understand that if God did not send his son Jesus to take up the punishment on the cross, the wages of sin would be death and Jesus would not have absorbed that death. That death would have struck you. Is there anyone you have refused to forgive? Look at the cross. Look at the 3.25 trillion that has been released from your life and willingly, quickly release the debts of those who've hurt you. All right? Verse 31, it goes on to say, so when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved. And they came and they told their master all that had been done. Verse 32, then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgive you all that debt because you begged me. Look at that. You wicked servant. <laughs> Guys, that is very, very strong language. Let me use another color. Let me just maintain the one that I had. You wicked servant. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, for every time we hold on to bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, we think we are the victims. Jesus says, you stop being a victim, you become a villain. And in the eyes of God, you are wicked. Guess what am I trying to say? Please be ready to understand that the cross of Jesus Christ took out the debt that you and I could not pay. And that debt was not because we were weak, but it's because we were wicked. And if we move on and change by that fact, then we remain wicked. It's only unforgiving people who have already been forgiven who qualify to be called wicked, rightly so by the Lord. It is not an unjust statement. It is not unfair. And what God is trying to do, he's trying to make us overcome the problem of pain. What is the problem of pain? The problem of pain is self-centeredness. When human beings go through pain, one of the things that really, really destroys them is the self-centered nature. What about me? What about my pain? What about what he did to me? What she did to me, 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 me? Now, that is not to say that the pain you go through is not valid. It is valid. But if you remain, if you remain self-absorbed, if you remain self-focused, if you remain inward-looking, you move from being a victim and you soon become a villain. Verse 33, should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Should you not? Should you not? Should you not have seen that the gospel of Jesus Christ has your sins forgiven and has granted you eternal life freely? What have you done to, re to deserve that eternal life? Absolutely nothing. Shouldn't you have seen that you are truly forgiven? And had pity on your servant as well. The reason why we remain in bitterness and unforgiveness is because we don't understand the cross of Jesus Christ. And if we do understand it, we understand it in our heads and not in our hearts. It's just another story 
in our minds, but it has not transformed our hearts. Verse 34, his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Now, verse 34 is printed the reality of bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness. That you are delivered to the torturers until you should pay all that was due to you. Now, first of all, due, due to the king. Now, first of all, you cannot pay. <laughs> Please understand that. You cannot pay. And it's telling us that bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment tortures you. You are tortured. There are other theologians who look at this and say the torturers could even at times be spiritual attacks from demons where you are oppressed. You're oppressed and clean spirits oppress you. They torture you. They torture you until you pay. When? Until you forgive. There's some of you who are going through spiritual warfare and that spiritual warfare does not need you to fast an extra week. It just needs you to forgive. That spiritual warfare does not need you to go on a mountain and call on the name of the Lord. It does not need you to go on to a dry fast and just, you know, and really, really uh, do some enigmatic warfare. No, it just requires you to forgive. You know, the way we do spiritual warfare is through some simple things. Forgiving those who've hurt you. And the Bible goes on in verse 35 by saying, So my heavenly Father will also do to each of you if from his heart you do not forgive your brother's trespasses. Guys, what is Jesus saying? He's saying it, it kind of gets hard to forgive someone a debt of 3.25 trillion when he's unwilling to forgive a 50,000 Kenya shilling debt. Especially if the 3.5 trillion was acquired through corrupt means. But the 50,000 shillings was a, was a loan. Perhaps the other person was not even did not steal from me. They just, you just loaned the money. And when you look at the story, it seems as if the second servant was loaned that money, but they've not paid it. But this 3.25 trillion that the first servant owed the king was stolen. It's most likely that it was stolen through corruption. And so God in his wisdom looks at us and says, why would I extend forgiveness to, to 3.25 trillion that was extended, that, that was, that, that, tortured the lives of many i mean that's the economy of a country people died people people are in people are in disarray injustice is rife the repercussion of your sins has affected myriads of people myriads and it's out of your wicked corrupt heart and yet you would not forgive a 50000 debt where you are only partly inconvenienced and perhaps even this 50,000 Kenya shilling debt, perhaps it's not even your money. Perhaps it's part of the 3.25 trillion that you stole. Perhaps it's part of the corrupt money, so it's not really your money. <laughs> and this is what the Bible is saying, that every offenses by people towards us are really offenses against God. And that's why Jesus had the knack and the girl to actually say your sins are forgiven when he met people. Because every offense towards our fellow brothers is ultimately an offense towards God. Do not hinder the grace of God. Do not miss out on the grace of God. Do not miss out on the forgiveness of God because you're holding on to bitterness. I want you to look at what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. Um, chapter 12, verse 15. It says, start from verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 15, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by this many become defiled. You can actually forfeit the grace of God. You can forfeit the grace of God because of bitterness and unforgiveness. Do not forfeit the grace of God in your life. Now guys, how do we forgive? This is how we forgive. And if you know the people you need to forgive, I want you to do something. I want you to take a piece of paper and write down the names of those people. And once you write the names, write the offenses they've cost you. Okay? Step number one, write the names of the people and write the offenses they've cost you. So if it is dad, write their dad. What did dad do? Abandoned me for, did not help me, did not show up. Mom. Why do I forgive mom? Because of this, because of that. My ex, why do I forgive them? Taking advantage of me, using me. Oh, I'm the I'm forgiving. Myself, perhaps you could even be angry at yourself. Write your own name there. I forgive myself. Why? Say, I forgive myself for letting myself down, doing drugs, bad company. You must articulate it. 
So that's the first thing you must do. Okay, write the names and write down the offenses of the people. Secondly, I want you to follow this list where you acknowledge the pain, forgive offenses, release the pain, and bless the person. Four steps. One, acknowledge the pain. Two, forgive offenses. Three, release the pain. And four, bless the person. So let's start with number one, acknowledge the pain. What does acknowledge the pain mean? The acknowledge the pain means go through your list and speak to God. Okay, and this must be done in a prayer session. And it's best if you can do it with your prayer partner, someone who keeps you accountable. And most likely someone of the someone of the same sex. Okay. If you're married, you could do this with your partner. If you're in a relationship, you could do this with your partner. That's okay. Um and what can you do? Acknowledge pain. So if you're doing it with your partner, of course that's someone of the opposite sex. Um, but if you are single, I would suggest do it with someone of the uh same sex because um this is deep emotional. It's a deep, this is a deeply emotional side of you, and you don't want to have an unnecessary emotional entanglements with someone else, okay? So that's why I'm asking that, okay? Your prayer partner ultimately should be someone of the opposite sex, someone of the same sex, rather, okay? So that um, you don't defraud yourself emotionally. So um, in a prayer session, acknowledge the pain. Say, Lord, I acknowledge that, I acknowledge that honest hurt me. I acknowledge that dad hurt me. I acknowledge that mom hurt me. I acknowledge that my brother hurt me. Now tell the Lord exactly what he did. He left me. He abandoned me. He used me. She lied to me. She betrayed me. She 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 took advantage of my goodness. Acknowledge it. There's power in acknowledging the pain. There's power in acknowledging it. There's power in just saying this is what happened. Some of you, perhaps the pain is going on because you're not even come to terms with accepting that it happened. Acknowledge. He left me. He married my best friend. He cheated on me. He slept with my sister. I acknowledge the pain. After that, forgive the offenses. Say, Lord, I forgive them. I forgive them for abandoning me. And I forgive them because Jesus, you paid a debt of 3.25 trillion and I only paid nothing. You did it for me for free. And because you did that great payment and you protected me from the fires of hell, I hereby extend that grace to this 50,000 debt. I forgive. I forgive them. And mention the offenses. I forgive them for doing this. I forgive them for hurting me. I forgive them. That's number two. Then number three, release the pain. I release the pain. I let it go. I let it go. I let it go. I refuse to hold on to it. I let it go. I let it go completely. I let it go. I release this person. I, I refuse to retaliate. I give up the right to retaliate. I give it up. And finally, bless the person. Lord, bless them. Now, blessing is very important. Many people don't bless. And because they don't bless, um, at times you remain in cycles of pain. Blessing this person removes any spiritual attacks on you and it ensures that you are walking in love because this is love and the enemy cannot attack you when you're walking in love. Bless your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. This is exactly what you're doing. Lord, I bless them. And be specific in your blessing. Be very specific in your blessing. I bless them. I bless them. I bless the work of their hands. Bless their job. Bless their marriage. Bless their kids. Meet their needs. Be with them. Sustain them. Don't hold back your blessing on them. Oh Lord, cover them. And once you bless them, guys, search your heart. Because Today you could forgive someone and tomorrow you could feel a fresh tinge of pain. What you do, you go through that process again. You acknowledge the pain, forgive offenses, release the pain, bless the person. Acknowledge the pain, forgive offenses, release the pain, bless the person. Maybe let me write that down. Let me open my notes. All right. Um, new one. All right. How to forgive. So, remember the first thing, first step was to write their names and write the offenses and write down the offenses. And for that first step, it could take some of you, <laughs> it could take some of you forever, okay? 
it could take some of you a long time because those offenses are long. So even if you feel full scaps, it's okay, just write it down. And there's a therapy that happens just by doing that. And the second step um, is acknowledge pain. So perhaps let's come down here and say, number one, acknowledge pain. Oh, spelling. Acknowledge pain. Two, forgive offenses. Three, release the pain. Four, bless the person. Okay? And then repeat as often as pain resurfaces. This is step three. All right. So, first step write the names and write down the offenses on a piece of paper. Second step acknowledge the pain, speak it, acknowledge it, say it, forgive offenses, forgive them. All right. And and then release the pain, release it, give up the right to retaliate, bless the person, be very specific in your blessing. Then step three, repeat as often as the pain resurfaces. Why do we have a step three? Because not all, no, not all forgiveness journeys are the same. Forgiveness is not an event, it's a journey. And for some people, you'll realize that you're living with this person. And when you keep forgiving them, this is what happens. Huh? Some of you may say, oh, Anis, I'll get so tired of forgiving them. Not in light of the gospel you want. Not in light of the gospel you want. When you understand how much God has forgiven you, guys, you are willing to forgive 70 times 7. Not 7 times. You see, Peter said 7 times and he got tired. But with that 70 times 7, why? In light of the gospel, forgiveness, we always have a fresh reservoir of forgiveness. And we can always forgive as often as the pain resurfaces. What does that do? What that does is that it, it refreshes your heart. Bitterness, resentment, pain, heaviness, depression cannot touch a heart that constantly forgives. But you see, you have to choose between your healing or your pride. If you choose your pride, if you say, Dush, I'm too proud to keep forgiving this person, then what you actually say that not only are you too proud to forgive them, but also secondly, you are like the unforgiving servant who has forgiven the 3.5 trillion that has been paid, that, that, he's been, that, that has been paid on his behalf. But also thirdly, is that the repercussions of depression, the repercussions of heaviness mean nothing to you. You need to really humble yourself. People say, swallow your pride. We've got something better. We say, don't swallow your pride. Vomit it all out together. Please understand that the path to healing is through humility. It's through humility. The gospel humbles us. We understand we are more sinful than we thought, but we are more loved. God has accepted that he's taken away our sin. Write the names. Write all the offenses. Forgive. Acknowledge the pain, forgive offenses, release the pain, bless the person, repeat as often as the pain resurfaces. Once something will happen, because some, some pain is like a stubborn stain on a wall. You forgive, but you still feel the pain. You forgive, but you still feel the pain. One day as you keep forgiving, one day the pain goes away. And no matter what that person does, says, or, 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 or whatever attitude they show you, one day you realize it has no effect on your heart. Why? Your heart has learned to thrive because the gospel has transformed it. Ladies and gentlemen, I call us to forgive. As God has forgiven us, may we forgive. Be blessed in Jesus' name.